Chapter 7 Explanations The lights of the subway kept flickering as the train sailed along. It created an uneasy atmosphere as the cars would become dark and light over and over again. Milo closed his eyes so he didn't have to see it. But keeping his eyes shut only served to make him queasy, and that certainly didn't help matters. When he opened his eyes, Alice was standing directly in front of him. She held her face in a mournful gaze. Trying to close it out too? She asked. Milo nodded. It won't work. I've tried everything from closing my eyes to pacing from car to car. I can't escape it. Something just feels wrong down here. Milo gave it some thought and took a deep breath. He let the air pass through his nostrils and felt it fill his lungs like poison. He sighed and let it out with one long pass and looked at her. At least we're getting somewhere now. We wouldn't have covered this much ground in a week's time if we'd been left on foot. We're lucky that Victor knew how to drive this thing. The lights continued flashing and Alice sat down next to him. Milo recoiled from her at first but caught himself and relaxed as much as he could. She looked at him quizzically. Why do you look at me like that? A lump caught in Milo's throat and he shook his head, pretending to not know what she was talking about. There. You did it again, she said. As if you're thinking something and can't get it out of your mouth. What is it? Milo brushed his hair back and racked his brain for some false explanation he could give her but found nothing. From beyond them he heard the door open and Dexter walked into the room. It's because he likes you said Dexter as he winced in pain and plopped down across from them. Alice glanced back and forth between the two boys and bit her lip. She finally caught Milo's gaze and he quickly looked away. She tilted her head. Is that true? she asked. Is what true? asked Milo, trying to avoid the subject. Do you... like me? she asked in her best naive voice. Oh, that... <clears throat> stammered Milo. Yeah. Alice smiled broadly and leaned back in her seat and began laughing. She brushed her hair out of her face when she'd settled down and looked at him earnestly. I knew it, she began. I've been waiting for you to say something. Milo forced a chuckle and turned his head to look out at the blinking lights outside the window. He could feel her staring at him and it made him nervous. Well, I mean she said through a smile. You're great in everything, but I don't think things would work out well between us, considering the state of things right now. I know that. I'm not stupid. Maybe if things were different. But Milo stood up and headed for the door. They aren't, he said before closing it behind him. He wiped a bead of sweat from his forehead before continuing through the other cars, toward the engine where he found Victor. He was flipping switches and monitoring various screens and gauges. At first, Victor didn't even notice that someone had entered the room, but when he looked over his shoulder and found Milo standing there, he took little interest. Where are we? asked Milo. About halfway to the station closest to Elite Industries. If that's where we're going, then we should be there in about half an hour. Milo nodded and tapped his finger on a gauge. Don't touch anything in here, please, said Victor calmly. Right. Milo backed away from the controls and sat down. So, are you going to tell me why your wife would be in this city if you guys were from England? Victor looked at Milo out of the corner of his eye, but otherwise showed no sign that the question had been asked. Because I don't really understand how that's possible, said Milo a bit forcefully. It's a very long story, said Victor. He had told Milo this before. I don't care. I want you to tell me. Victor ran his hands through his hair and sat down. He held his head in his hands and sighed. Very well. I lived in a town. Just outside of London. My wife lived with me, of course. About seven years ago, something strange began to happen to the village. Nobody could explain. 
Every word seemed to drag some bit of energy right out of Victor, and Milo was starting to feel bad for him already. And people began to die, mysteriously. The same way, every time. They'd turn white and complain. They couldn't breathe. Nothing could be done. Within minutes, someone who was perfectly healthy would be on the floor. Dead. Victor lowered his hand and looked out the front window. My wife was the eighth person to die. It wasn't three weeks later and everyone in the town had passed away except for me. Victor seemed to grow angry at his own words. He tried everything to stop it and nothing worked. For some reason, I'm alive. Milo felt his mouth drop open and kept his eyes glued to Victor as he stood back up. Of course, the neighboring town suspected me of being guilty of the entire thing. They said I'd poisoned everyone to take their land or some rubbish. Everyone looked at me with hatred in their eyes. Some threatened to kill me if they found me anywhere near their homes. I became a recluse and stayed in my house. Until I received a letter in the mail, that is. The letter from your wife? Asked Milo. Yes. The letter from my dead wife whom I had buried myself. You can imagine my confusion. I was fearful and intrigued. I had to find out if she was truly alive in this place. So I left my home and I came here. What did the other towns think about that? They thought I was leaving because of the guilt I felt for murdering everyone. Even after all that, they still thought you murdered everyone? Milo, how could I prove them wrong? Why would anyone believe that I hadn't murdered them? Why should they? Milo let his head fall back against the chair and Victor turned back to the controls of the train. It didn't make much sense. Victor could have been lying, but something about the way he spoke seemed to force Milo into believing him. By the way, said Victor suddenly, if I were you, I would not trust that girl you've got tagging along with you. I know you think you like her. Don't let it cloud your judgment. Milo stood up and began to defend Alice and his decisions, but he found no suitable words. He merely turned back around and headed back through the cars toward where he had left her and Dexter. They were sitting there in a strange sort of silence when he walked in, and he decided not to be the one to break it. Alice did it for him. Milo, listen. I don't want to talk about it. It's over and done. Let's just worry about what we've got to do. Alice looked shattered but just bit her lips hard and turned away. Dexter turned to Milo and spoke. What's going on with Victor? He's driving the train, said Milo flatly. Dexter stood up and punched Milo. The force of his fist knocked Milo out of his chair and Alice let out a squeak of a scream. Milo held a hand to his throbbing cheek and looked up from the floor at Dex, who was still standing there with his arm out. You need to get your shit together, Milo, before this whole thing falls apart. With those parting words, Dexter spun on his heels and stormed out of the train car towards the back of the train. Alice looked at Milo and bent down over him. You're bleeding, she said as she wiped his cheek with a piece of cloth. I know, he said. Alice helped him back to his feet and she continued to wipe his cheek whenever a new drop of blood would emerge from the scrape that had appeared just below his eye. She kept looking at him when she'd walk away and it kept giving Milo chills. She'd never looked at him quite like that before. What did the two of you talk about while I was in the engine car? He asked her at last, just to break the silence. Lots of things, she responded quietly. He told me about how you guys have been friends for so long. Some of the things you used to do when you were kids. He looks up to you, did you know that? Milo nodded solemnly. He was telling me about how much this adventure of yours means to you, 
and how he was scared to come with you, but even more afraid of letting you down. Alice shook her head and sat down. Milo felt a twinge of guilt wash over him and he wiped his own blood away. Throughout Dexter and his friendship, the two of them had always had heated moments where it seemed they may never speak to each other again. Somehow it usually could be traced back to some sort of mistake Milo had made that had caused them to descend into friction. He's always been there for me. I've tried to be there for him too, but Dexter is hard to understand sometimes. He always seems so happy and go lucky. He doesn't say when he's angry or upset until it sort of just explodes out of him. He's always been that way. I think I've got that, she said with a wry grin. But you have to go and talk to him. Figure out what's going on with him and work through it. We've got a lot of trouble ahead of us and we can't work it out unless you guys are on the same page. But he won't listen to me. Not anymore. Milo hung his head and closed his eyes. In his mind, he found a memory of a summer's day when Milo had begged Dexter to come with him to the roof of the hotel to see the stars. Dexter had punched Milo that day, too. Milo was pulling on Dex's arm while telling him how awe-inspiring the view was from the roof, and Dex was pleading for him to stop. Finally, Dexter had reared his other arm back and brought it crashing into Milo's face. They both had looked at each other with tears in their eyes and apologized. In the end, Milo had went home and left Dexter at the hotel. They would meet with each other the next day and never mention the event again. Milo felt his eye twitch and the tear rolled down his cheek. Alice was looking at him and seemed to be almost crying herself. I gotta go, he said as he stood and exited the same way Dexter had. Dexter was sitting in the next car and he was watching out of the window. He wasn't crying, to Milo's surprise. In fact, he barely looked sad at all. The expression on his face was something completely different. It reminded Milo of someone who had been defeated in life. Far too old of a face to belong to someone as young as they both were. Hey, said Milo as he sat down across from Dexter. His voice cracked and quivered, but he got the words out. Hey. Anything interesting out there? Asked Milo, pointing a finger out the window. Not really, no, replied Dexter. Just some lights, a lot of concrete. Milo bent down and peered out the window. The concrete walls and pillars were passing by so quickly that he could barely catch sight of one before it flashed by and was gone. Dexter turned his head and looked up at Milo. I don't think I'm ever going to see my parents again, Milo. These people vanishing. It doesn't make any goddamn sense that we haven't run into anybody outside of our district besides Alice. His voice trailed off and he looked back out the window. I'm sure they're fine, Dex. Milo said gently. They'll be waiting for us when we get back. I'm sure of it. Dexter shook his head. Milo was beginning to have his doubts as well. The idea that they would return home to find Jack and Mary waiting for them as if nothing had ever happened was a hard one to believe. No, Milo. It's not going to happen like that. Pandora knows we're out here and he knows what we're doing. I don't know why he cares so much, but there must be a reason. I wouldn't be surprised if he's already sent a legion of elite soldiers to our... to our district and killed... Again, his voice trailed off, and this time he broke into tears. I know how you feel, Dex. You're just homesick. You don't know, he yelled. You've no fucking idea because you don't have a family. That's the only reason we're even out here right now. Because your family's already dead and you couldn't handle it. So we left my family behind to die so that we can go searching for your stupid goddamn ghost. Milo fell back into his chair and felt his head quiver in anger. He bit his tongue and held his head back before letting out his air. If that's how you felt, then why did you come with me? He asked. 
If you thought I was being so stupid, then why would you have even bothered coming out here? Because you would have done the same for me, roared Dexter as he slammed a fist into his chair. I knew you would come hunting for shadows if I had asked you. I felt guilty. I didn't want to do the same for you. Milo looked at his friend in bewilderment. You felt guilty? I knew you would risk anything for me. And I, I had to do the same for you. I, I don't know. Loyalty or something. I owed you. You don't owe me anything, Dex. Said Milo. Why would you? Dexter looked up and brushed his hair back. The blonde wisps were wet with sweat and tears. But you've always been there, Milo. Every time I needed you, I couldn't let you down. Hey, started Milo. There were things I didn't want to do when you asked me to. I did things that I hated doing, but I did it because you were my friend. That's the same thing you did for me when you left home to go with me. You don't owe me. Dexter was circling a finger around the button in his red velvet seat and staring out the window. He closed his eyes. I guess so. I know you don't trust Alice and Victor, but we need them right now. Do you trust me, at least? Yeah. Well, I trust them, said Milo, doubting it as he said it. Are you going to be all right? Dexter wiped his eyes and brushed off his jacket. He stood up and gazed down his nose at Milo in his seat. I'll be fine, he said. Milo expressed his relief and then accepted a hand from Dexter as he stood up. Together they walked down the hall and through the door back to the car, where Alice was sitting asleep in her chair. Dexter caught Milo staring and shook his head as he stretched out across the floor and closed his eyes. Milo gave one last look at his friends and then propped himself against the wall of the train and fell quickly into sleep. The lurch of the train jarred his eyes open, but it was the sound of the brakes squealing as they tried valiantly to stop the tons of moving steel that truly woke him up. Milo jumped to his feet and nearly fell over as the force of the train began to pull him in the other direction. Dexter and Alice stood up too and were both screaming. What's happening? He heard Alice shout as all the lights went out. I don't know, said Dexter. Milo began walking forward and nearly fell over as the train lurched again and started to speed back up. Alice fell into him and for a moment that seemed to last longer than it should have, he held her, before standing her back up and walking towards the door. We have to get to the engine car, now, he hollered back to them. They followed behind him with much difficulty in the dark. The next car was dark as well and there were loose food carts rolling around as the train continued to change speeds. One of them nearly crashed into Milo, but he pushed it out of his way and quickly bounded towards the next door. He threw it open to find Victor at the helm of the train's controls, doing everything he could to keep the train on the tracks. What the hell is going on? asked Dexter as he plunged into the engine car behind Milo. I don't know, said Victor in a calm and quiet tone. I've lost control of everything and the train is overheating. I'm pretty sure if I can't get it to stop, it's going to explode. Alice and Dexter asked, what? At the same time, but Milo just stepped forward. What do we do? Victor turned from the controls and looked at Milo intently. There is a station coming up in about two minutes. We'll have to jump there and move above ground from wherever that leaves us. Milo laughed and agreed. All right then, he said. Come on guys, we have to jump from a moving subway train. He led the rest of them to the back of the train as the lights flickered on and off at random and the train seemed to be fighting its own momentum. He opened the back door and looked at Victor. How far to the station? He asked. How should I know? The positioning system is at the controls. His tones seemed to betray the calm in his voice. But a light was shining from behind them and Milo could see that the walls had widened. Quickly he motioned for Dexter to jump and he watched as his friends leapt from the train. Alice followed behind as she collapsed to the ground below and held her hip. You first, he said to Victor. But Victor let out a deep laugh that made Milo cringe as he grabbed Milo's shirt collar and tossed him from the back of the train. As Milo came rolling to a stop, he looked back up and watched as the train burst into flames and continued down the tracks before it vanished around the corner.
Dexter and Alice came running up behind him. What happened? they asked him. He, he didn't jump, said Milo in a whisper that didn't feel like it had come from his own mouth. The others looked down the tunnel in horror before pulling Milo to his feet. They were in some sort of train station, and Milo could see the exits to his left. We have to go, Milo, he heard Dexter's voice say, but his feet wouldn't move. He had to force every step, and the others seemed to be pushing him onwards. The sound of Victor's laugh echoed in his brain like so many memories had rambled through before it. His sight was clouded by the view of the train exploding as it rolled around the corner. He could hear Alice and Dexter trying to get through to him, but he couldn't bring himself to face them. Nothing makes any sense anymore, he thought as they propped him up against the stairs. Finally, he opened his eyes and stood up. Where are we? He asked them. District 20, said Dex as he handed the map to Milo. Then we need to head north. We're almost there. The others looked at him as if they were worried he'd lost his mind. And maybe he had. But he held the map out in front of himself and continued up the steps and into the open world above them. The light of the sky hurt his eyes, and he was disappointed to see that the fog had returned.